Thank you very much for those um, remarkable words. I really appreciate what you've said, and it's a huge honour and a pleasure for me to be here this evening, and uh, thank you very much to all of you for coming to listen. As an officer cadet at Sandhurst, which is our officer training school, the equivalent of the US as West Point, in 1977, I studied the wars and campaigns of the Israel-Palestine conflict in great depth, learning lessons in leadership, tactics, and strategy from the always victorious operations of the Israel Defense Force. Years before that, in my school playground, girls always shopped, boys always played war. Normally, it was the British against the Germans, or the Cowboys against the Indians that we played. But for a time in 1967, it became Israelis and Arabs. But after a few weeks, it reverted to the usual antagonists, because nobody seemed to want to play on the Arab side. And I gather a similar recruitment problem exists today in the playgrounds of England, with the Taliban side also short of troops. At the age of eight, I was a little bit young for the serious study of military science beyond the playground. But later, as a 14-year-old schoolboy, I remember one day during the Yom Kippur War, my form master, a young chap just out of teacher training college, came into the classroom with an armful of newspapers. And he said, normal lessons will stop because of the real war beginning. And that it was going to be incredibly exciting and we should study it. And every day we followed the events over here in the Yom Kippur War. We wrote our own stories of the war. We learned the geography. My father was bitterly unamused when all of the articles about the war had been cut out before he could get his hands on his breakfast newspaper. We at school were quite disappointed, I'm sure those of you who were here weren't, but we were quite disappointed when the war finished quickly and we had to resume normal lessons. Why am I telling you all of this? Because from my recollection in those days, both of the 1967 and 73 wars, it was all about the good fighting the bad. And the good were expected to win. It was very simple, even for a 14-year-old. Even as late as 1973, Israel was still widely seen as the good guys. And the Arabs were the bad guys. Sympathy was with Israel because they were being picked on and bullied and outnumbered by massed Arab armies. There was little consideration of the legitimacy of Israel. It was taken for granted. In 1967, the capture and occupation of East Jerusalem, which of course we commemorated on Sunday, just gone, as Jerusalem Day, and of Judea and Samaria were accepted as a legitimate act of self-defense. This was not true just for those of us still at school and in the fledgling days of a military career. This was the general view of the British people and of many in the West, of course, with plenty of exceptions. Back then in the 60s and 70s, young minds were still being shaped by traditional views of good and evil. The valiant comic, read by most schoolboys, myself included, was all about heroic Tommies beating the treacherous Nazis or the fanatical Japanese. 
War films, on the whole, told the same stories and without any of the graphic violence of today. We had the longest day, the guns of Navarone and Zulu. The BBC was neutral and, if anything, supported the values of the country that paid for it. On the whole, like other UK news services of the day, it sought to convey events from the Middle East and everywhere else free of a political agenda, either left or right. In general, popular culture still reflected the long accepted beliefs and principles of a Christian society. All of this shaped the views of the majority of people. We live in a very different world today. In 40 years, just 40 years, the general opinion of Israelis and their Arab foes has been reversed. What has changed? Some say the situation is different, but this is not the case at all. Fundamentally, the situation remains the same. Israel's stance is unchanged since 1948. A desire for the survival of the Jewish national homeland at peace with its neighbours. All that has changed about this has been that Israel has made repeated costly concessions, including giving up land for peace, concessions which have not been reciprocated by the Palestinians, but instead exploited at the grave expense of the State of Israel, concessions which have not been acknowledged or even remembered by the international community who, like the Palestinians, simply and uncompromisingly demand more and more and more and more. Nor have the Arabs fundamentally changed. We have, of course, today peace treaties with Egypt and Jordan, and the growing threats from Iran and from the expanding Sunni jihadism in the region may be leading to some temporary, tactical, and below the radar mutual cooperation from parts of the Arab world. But the underlying perspective and agenda, especially among the Palestinians, is the same as it was in the 1920s, the 1930s, and the 1940s. Rejection of Jewish communities in the land of Israel. The destruction of the Jewish state. Some of the basic dynamics have indeed altered. Before, organized, uniformed, and relatively disciplined and conventional Arab armies fought under their national flag. Today, those armies have been replaced by terrorist gangsters and black-coated jihadists. Conventional war has been replaced by terrorist attacks. Battles fought between tanks and infantry in remote deserts have been replaced by battles fought in densely populated civilian areas and behind the protection of human shields. In my view, if such events as the Gaza conflict last summer had been played out in the 1960s and 1970s, the support for Israel in the West would have been even greater than it was then. The savage and murderous actions of the Palestinians are far more shocking today than the actions of the Arab armies were back then. So I again ask the question, what has changed? The morality and values of the West. They have been transformed almost beyond recognition. As public opinion in the West in the 60s and 70s was influenced by popular culture, so it is today. Throughout most of the West, and certainly in Europe, Judeo-Christian principles, honesty, family values, respect for the state, honour and loyalty have all been eroded, often beyond recognition. Negative values, such as the acceptance of betrayal, duplicity and deceit, have flourished. Defining values, including patriotism 
and religious faith have been undermined. We have gone from the heroic Tommies of the Valiant comic to the promotion of the criminal underworld in Grand Theft Auto, from Guns of Navarone to the naked violence of Terminator 3. The 80s ushered in the insidious campaign of political correctness and moral rev relativity that has over the last 30 years gripped and taken over so much of our society. Balanced, level-headed, impartial reporting in our media has been replaced by sensationalism as the purpose of mass media has swung from informing, educating and edifying to making money and only too often to making the news rather than just reporting it. These negative and destructive values are being promoted constantly in the Western world. The values and morality of the average person in the West have changed dramatically since the 1970s. The new values often have more in common with Israel's enemies than they do with Israel itself. We all know, but rarely have the courage to say, that hypocrisy, duplicity, betrayal, and sensationalism are the four cornerstones of violent, radical Islam, as so often demonstrated to us on our TV screens by Hamas and the Islamic State. It is impossible to avoid a connection between the shift in public opinion on Israel and the change in Western morality. How has the new morality impacted on public opinion and perception? The shift in the way war is presented has complicated the issue. War is no longer the good guy fighting the bad with the good expected to win. Political correctness encourages individuals to say what they think is seen as acceptable and will not offend the majority rather than what they actually believe. This perpetuates itself and can lead to wholly unacceptable beliefs being outwardly and widely accepted and becoming the received wisdom. The destruction of defining values means that people will now accept physical acts that would before have been utterly abhorrent to them. The media destruction and character assassination of strong, outspoken leaders has led to the rise of the grey man. Political leaders are often seen as weak and gutless and will not stake their reputations on making bold, uncompromising principle statements or decisions. Instead, they frequently take the safer middle ground. The population tends also to take on the mannerisms of their leaders, also becoming grey. Sensationalism and the graphic depiction of violence has made the population increasingly immune to the horrors of violent atrocities, such as public beheadings, massacre, kidnap, execution, torture, and forcing your own people to die as human shields. These acts are now less likely to swing public opinion towards the good guys. The glorious fight for a noble cause inspired by Christian values and beliefs and fought with honour and dignity, the like of which has preoccupied, preoccupied generations of British soldiers before me is now regrettably a thing of the past. So many of these extraordinary changes have been influenced and driven through by a media, especially broadcast media, especially television, that to a very great extent has been taken over and subverted by those with a moral relativism heightened by an abhorrence for the traditional Judeo-Christian values of the West and a desire to promote as superior the values of other cultures in a form of all-pervading post-colonial guilt. The target is Western values themselves. Most often represented by the United States of America, the most powerful 
country in the world. But Israel has increasingly become a proxy for the United States for three reasons. Firstly, the US president and the US government is at present left-wing and liberal, and thus much harder for left-wing liberals to attack. Second, Israel is smaller and more easily bullied and impacted by corrosive media sniping than is a superpower. Thirdly, Israel can be portrayed, and is portrayed, as a Western colonial outpost in a rightfully Arab world. These three things are underpinned by a pervasive and increasing anti-Semitism, which intensifies the obsession with Israel and its portrayal as a true evil to be attacked at every possible opportunity. This contrasts with the post-colonial guilt I mentioned, combined also with a frequent desire to appease violent Islam and promote its cause and values as being superior to our own, and certainly to Israel's. Any anti-Islam comment or perspective cannot be tolerated. While anti-Jewish, anti-Zionist and anti-Israel perspectives are all acceptable and encouraged. In turn, these double standards are reinforced by the grey man syndrome, the corrosive political correctness that I mentioned, under which the majority feel obliged to support Israel's enemies and oppose Israel and feel nervous about not doing so. History has proven time and again that Arab nations, with all their massed armies, cannot defeat Israel on the field of battle. And this will always be the case. That is, of course, why the Palestinians have chosen to use terrorist methods to attack the civilian population rather than conventional military forces to attack Israel's army. It is why Hamas fires missiles at Israel and digs attack tunnels. These measures, like other terrorist attacks against the Israeli population, are not designed to damage or defeat Israel, because they cannot, and their perpetrators know that they cannot. They're designed for two different purposes. The lesser purpose is to demonstrate to their own population and their supporters that they're fighting for them and against an existential threat to them. The last bankrupt cause recourse of all troubled regimes. But the far greater purpose is to provoke the inevitable and unavoidable Israeli reaction. Hamas and the other Palestinian terror groups don't use human shields in the hope that Israel will refrain from attacking their rocket launchers, weapons dumps, command centers, terrorist bases, or tunnel entrances. They use human shields in the hope that Israel will attack and kill their people. And they do this for one purpose, to gain the global condemnation of the state of Israel. Their particular target is the media, which they know will magnify and intensify their message to the world and force national governments, the United Nations, human rights groups and other international organisations to bring down unbearable pressure onto Israel. This can only work, of course, if the media and these global organisations are willing to be subverted by their message, willing to see them as the victims and Israel as the demons. Fatah and the Palestinian Authority have a similar strategy. Their violence is of a different nature, incentivizing terror by paying terrorists and the families of terrorists killed or imprisoned for attacking Israelis, by inciting anti-Israel hatred through speeches, newspapers, broadcast media, school textbooks and school teachers. Not only does this entrench anti-Israeli feeling that will prevent the acceptance of a two-state solution or any form of peace and future cooperation with Israel, but it also has the effect of inciting violence against Israeli troops and Israeli civilians who live 
in Judea and Samaria, including rioting, stone-throwing, ramming, battering, stabbing and murder. Again, the aim of this is to provoke an unavoidable reaction in order to attract global condemnation of Israel and bring unbearable pressure onto the Jewish state. The next stage for the Palestinian leadership, of course, is to exploit anti-Israel pressure through the United Nations, the International Criminal Court, the European Union, the universities, businesses, trade organizations, and now even FIFA. The goal of all this activity is to undermine the Jewish state, but the primary strategy is executed through a conspiracy with a compliant and complicit media. It is the media that brings pressure onto government leaders and heads of international organizations, compelling them to act in their weakness and with their values undermined. Many, of course, need little persuasion. But even here, the media provides them with the excuse, the motive, and the cover. It was strongly biased media reports alleging Israeli atrocities against Palestinians that either forced or allowed leaders like the US President, the British Foreign Secretary, the French Prime Minister and the UN Secretary General to demand that Israel did more to protect innocent civilians in Gaza during the fighting last summer. Never mentioning, suggesting or even hinting at what more Israel could do never acknowledging the context for the action, never condemning Hamas for the actual war crimes of using civilian locations as military facilities, compelling citizens to remain and failing in their legal duty to evacuate civilians from a military area. It is the media, the agents of moral relativism, the tools of the Palestinian leadership that are Israel's enemies in this conflict today. They can win over not just Western leaders, but the public who are imbued with the new morality. The media should, of course, get at the truth, and they should fearlessly expose wrongdoing and criminality from wherever it comes. While remaining even-handed, Western media should remain mindful of, and to an extent reflect, the values of the society that supports them, funds them, and depends on them. And of course, it is the changing nature of these values that much of the problem lies, as I've explained. It is not the role of the media, especially publicly funded media, to undermine the values of their society. It is not the role of the media to turn a blind eye to wrongdoing, corruption, law-breaking and immorality of one side while exaggerating, falsifying, distorting and overemphasizing allegations of wrongdoing against the other. But in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, this is, with a very few exceptions, exactly what the media do. In many cases, the, media, ma the major media organisations have moved from reporting the conflict to being active protagonists. Joseph Stalin once asked, famously, how many divisions has the Pope? The term press corps in relation to Israel has assumed a military meaning that was not previously intended. And like Stalin, we might ask, how many cores has the press? The answer is that the effectiveness of the press in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict on the side of Israel's enemies is immense, probably immeasurable. When the media distort and mislead, when they turn a blind eye, when they paint a false picture, they must be considered culpable for the consequences, for the violence that is provoked especially in this region, when they falsely report massacres, intentional targeting of babies, war crimes. For the anti-Semitism, including violent anti-Semitic attacks, and the terrorism around the world 
that their false prospectus inspires. They must share culpability for the consequences that follow when political leaders and human rights groups respond to the pressure that their distorted reporting piles on, for the legitimacy that their reports give to political factions around the world that are opposed to Israel, for encouraging terror tactics, war crimes, crimes against humanity and the use of human shields, by blaming Israel for the deaths of civilians rather than the terror groups who are actually responsible. I'm sure that most of you here in this room could recount many examples of exactly what I'm talking about from your own personal knowledge and even experience in some cases. I want to give you just a couple of examples from my own personal experience. I just finished a couple of years ago an interview on the conflict in Afghanistan in the studios of a major international broadcaster in London. I left the studio and was accosted in the corridor by one of the prominent Middle East correspondents of that news network. He said, I want to speak to you about what you say about Israel. And I said to him, I've been talking about Afghanistan, not about Israel. He said, no, but you talk about Israel a lot, and I want to talk to you about it. And I said, expecting the worst, I said, well, go on then, what is it? And he said, I agree with every word you say. And I said to him, so why don't you say the same thing? And he said, because if I do, I get the sack. I'd be fired. I went into the BBC studio here in Jerusalem um, during Operation Pillar of Defence a couple of years ago. And I did an interview for BBC News Channel live from the Bureau in Jerusalem. And I was asked do you agree that the, the Israel Defence Force is desperate to get in on the ground in Gaza? And I said, no, they're not. I've spoken to many generals, I've spoken to many commanders. They're ready to go in, they're prepared to go in, they will go in if necessary, but of course they don't want to send their troops on the ground into Gaza. And he said, well, that's fine, but the politicians want, the, want to get the troops on the ground into Gaza. I said, I've spoken to many cabinet ministers, many other leaders of government, many civil servants. The last thing they want to do is do it. They will if they have to, but they don't want to. And he said to me, but you're Jewish. <laughs> In other words, he couldn't go any further apart from to accuse me of the one thing that would discredit what I was saying and, and prove that I was lying, i.e. that I was Jewish. I don't believe that, by the way, but that's what he said to me. I was in Israel for the duration of the conflict last summer, for virtually the whole of the conflict in Gaza. And I was probably in a better position to understand what was happening here than the vast majority of non-Israeli Western military analysts. I am uh, a trusted, I don't know why, but I'm a trusted and often used analyst on defence, military, terrorism, intelligence matters on all manner of news networks in the UK, some in the US as well. I made myself available to all of the major news networks here to give my commentary on the conflict in Gaza, and I got not one single interview. Not one. Why? With the, with the exception of Fox News. <laughs> Why? Because, as I say, I'm a, a, a frequent and regular contributor of analysis to these networks. They portray me as a reliable and trusted commentator. But they know that my perspective on Israel is objective and truthful and therefore contradicts their own political agendas. And so they cannot bring me in and undermine me. They just have to keep me out of the studio. I've been accused of supporting genocide and being an apologist for war crimes. But in reality, I spent much of my life trying to prevent terrorist violence and attacks against innocent civilians. And I've often risked my own life to do so. I've been involved in peacekeeping operations and have physically intervened in situations where ethnic cleansing has been threatened. In social media, I've been the subject of sustained assaults by particularly virulent anti-Israel networks that I won't name here today because I don't want to give them the benefit of any publicity. I've had my words willfully distorted and falsified in the social media 
even as recently as last night. In universities, I've been the subject of demonstrations that have sought to silence me and sometimes succeeded. Most recently in the University of Sydney, only last month. I've been publicly accused of corruption and being in the pay of the Zionist entity. <laughs> Mossad, to be precise. I've got, I've got one observation on Mossad. They're a very effective intelligence service, one of the most respected in the world, probably the most respected in the world, but they're very, very bad at paying their checks. <laughs> I've been deliberately denied business opportunities. I've been subjected to virulent anti-Semitic hatred and threats. And I've been placed on a terrorist death list. Why is this? It's not because I speak out against the moral bankruptcy, corruption, incitement to terrorism, or oppression of the Palestinian Authority. It's not because, thank you very much, Professor. It's not because- the check. <laughs> I, ju I, ju I just hope it's gin, not water. <laughs> Next time. <laughs> it's not because I speak against the murder, brutality and terrorist violence of Hamas, Hezbollah or the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. I've spoken out at least as much in the media against Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, the Iranian regime and the IRGC, and many other sponsors of terror and terrorist groups without anything like this level of attempted intimidation against me. It is for one reason, and that is that I fail to falsely condemn Israel in circumstances where to be even neutral on the subject is itself a crime in the eyes of so many. It's because I've gone further and use my military experience and my objective view to explain and defend Israel's legitimate military actions. Of course, in the eyes of many in this region, this is already heinous in and of itself. But it is only heinous in the Western world because of the distortions of the media that amplifies the message and helps mobilize a public that is persuaded to reject traditional values and now adopt a new, politically correct, moral relativity. How do we fight this new form of political warfare when so much of the media is the enemy? As with all battles, we must conduct both defensive and offensive operations. The defense, in this case, of course, revolves around doing what we can to ensure that the truth is made known. Both the truth about Israel's enemies and how they act and the crimes they commit, and the truth about Israel and how, it force, how its forces operate. This must, of course, be the truth. I'm not suggesting false propaganda. I include in this truth open admissions when errors and wrongdoing take place, including and especially when innocent people die as a consequence. This is one of the many things that separate us out from our enemies who so often refuse to tell or report the truth. The offence in this form of warfare is in exposing the bias, the distortions, the untruth of the media. This is much more difficult than telling the truth but it is also vital. As in all forms of war, the best form of defense is attack. Without effective offensive action, our defensive work will succeed much less and can never ever produce decisive results. Some good and vital work is already being done by a range of groups, including NGO Monitor, with which I'm associated. But all of our effects, all of our effects, good though they are, remain limited. This campaign, this offensive campaign, has had much tactical success and it needs to continue and, if possible, to intensify. But so far, there has been no real strategic impact. Nothing, nothing 
that has forced major media networks to fund fundamentally rethink their anti-Israel agenda. Of course, strategic effect requires strategic assets. And by strategic assets, I mean the combination of significant funds, concerted and sustained will, and large-scale, thoroughly planned and carefully focused effort carried out by a large number of talented individuals. The challenge is, of course, immense. And as with any battle, there is absolutely no guarantee of success. As for myself, I have gone through the transmutation from infantry officer to fighter in this new form of political warfare. Much of my fight, as was recognised yesterday in the honour that was graciously and generously bestowed upon me here at bar -Alan University, is a fight for Israel. But to fight for Israel on the international media stage is also to fight for the values of democracy, freedom of speech and expression and civilised social values everywhere. All of the principles and virtues that once made Britain great I've spoken about and are, are represented in the fight for Israel. Make no mistake, this afternoon I've spoken about Israel's fight, but the danger that faces Israel and that the media projects extend far beyond Israel and threaten us all. We should never forget the words of Pastor Martin Niemöller, who said, then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. Israel's fight is the Western world's fight. Upon Israel's survival depends the survival of Western civilization. I am deeply honored by the award of a doctorate from bar -Alan University. The warm support, encouragement, and friendship of this great seat of learning will certainly help to sustain me and to renew my vigor in this fight for Israel and for freedom that I shall never, ever give up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.